first few months or first few years. And that is how our brain becomes what it is at the end of the day, is through these program cell apoptosis to prune and finalize that network between the different neurons. Okay, so we are going to go into cell division and uh, its control today. So today's lecture is going to be all about cell cycle. Um, so what are we, uh, remember last week we talked about how our body, um, you know, different hallmarks of cancer, uh, which included uh, a major category of how cancer occurs as mutations in the cell cycle pathway either cell cycle itself or the regulation of cell cycle, when cells are replicating and dividing and what type of signals they're receiving. Um, we also talked about DNA repair and how that can be used to ki kind of keep mutations at bay by recognizing them and fixing them through various different pathways throughout our uh, you know, cells, depending on what type of mutation is happening. If it's a single base pair, change versus if it is a more you know elaborate uh, mutation like a single strand or a double strand break um, so today we are going to now talk about cell cycle so you will notice that throughout um, this the six lectures related to this uh, module set for exam three we will be talking about normal cell uh, regulation organismal regulation of normal pathways and then comparing them to how they get disrupted in cancer cells or other diseases for that matter um, to give the phenotypes that you see in those disease states. And we are using cancer as an example because it hits a lot of major pathways that are important for our body to work appropriately and to survive. Okay. Uh, so today we are going to get an overview of the cell cycle. We will talk about the various phases um, of cell cycle and how each one is controlled. Um, we are also going to kind of touch uh, on some, not just master regulators or checkpoint proteins, but also specific proteins and cyclins that are uh, regulating each phase of the cell cycle. So by the end of today, you'll have kind of a mental picture of how these different proteins are going up and down, kind of in a little, you know, um, almost dance form to regulate the way our body, uh, our cells are getting response to the signals and dividing and replicating. So to start with, let's talk about an overview of our cell cycle. So we are going to spe specifically look at just somatic cell cycle right now, right? Uh, and this is just the way a single cell, a somatic cell will reproduce by uh, going through various phases in the end, producing two identical daughter cells. Um, usually this is controlled by signals that our bodies receive. Um, and our cells are receiving constantly both inhibitory as well as pro-growth signals. So it's always kind of like, you know, um, looking at a balance and seeing which way the balance is tilted. And that's how the cell will respond. Um, certain environmental cues may trigger a more increase, a really sharp increase in pro-growth signals, signaling them to replicate and divide. Other times there may be, uh, you know, nutritional deficit or some other environmental factor that makes the environment not amenable for uh, the cell survival. And in that case, you'll have inhibitory signals, uh, spikes to tell the cell to not waste energy, so to speak, on replication and division. Um, now, this process is very uh, controlled, both at the regulation level, but also when you go through the process itself, it's going to be very, you know, each step is going to be very concrete and replicated exactly the same way every single time. The chromosomes are going to condense, they're going to line up, they're going to divide in a very uh, concrete way, in a very particular way. However, depending on the type of cells you look at, the organism you're looking at, the duration of the cell cycle can vary a lot. So some, you know, this is giving you an example of how variable these cells can uh, be in the cell cycle that they, uh, they go through. Some eukaryotic cells will have as little as eight minute cycle. And that's the example would be an early fly embryo. 
similar things you can think about inside our body uh, during embryogenesis, when we have that rapid phase of cell growth in the first 12 weeks of development um, in utero, cells are cycling at a super high rate, at a much faster rate than they would um, later on once the uh, individual is born and actually uh, in its normal environment. Um, again, early fly embryo cells would mimic that same idea that they can, uh, uh, only frog embryos can mimic the same idea that they can replicate and divide within 30 minutes, right? Um, if you compare that to prokaryotic cell cycle, prokaryotes like, you know, your general bacteria, many of them can duplicate uh, within 20 minutes. So they go super fast and they go all the time, which is why an infection occurring from them um, can be so lethal and can spread so fast uh, because they have a much faster cell cycle duration um, than you may see in general embryo, uh, general eukaryotic cells. Um, now, when you look at mammalian cells like us, it also matters where that cell is located. Uh, for example, your skin cells are going to, you know, uh, or your epithelial layers are going to regenerate at a lot faster uh, rate than your brain cells, right? Your neurons don't regenerate the same way as um, your skins do or your epithelial cells do throughout your body. And in culture, we have even noticed that even in culture, in this out of body situation where you just have these cells isolated in perfect environment, so to speak, with lots of nutrients and growth factors around, there is a range of um, time that they may take to replicate uh, and divide, in, even in in vitro conditions. So intestinal epithelial cells take about 12 hours, while fibroblasts can take upwards of 20 hours. We have seen hepatocytes do the same thing, liver cells. And not only that, but you actually see the same kind of cycle appearing as it does inside the body in them when you first isolate them. So if I isolated liver cells from a younger individual, they'll cycle a lot faster, they'll divide a lot faster and a lot more before they stop compared to hepatocytes or liver cells from older individual, which will it typically take a lot longer to divide and they will um, stall and stop quicker uh, because they would reach senescence a lot quicker. Uh, so when uh, let's look at the general cell cycle and what it entails in this, you know, whether it is eight minutes, 30 minutes, 12 hours, 20 minutes, you know, hours doesn't matter. It still has to go through all these phases. So let's see what happens in each one of these phases, right? So in our uh, typical cell cycle, there are four phases that you guys have, should be familiar with already. So this should be a little bit of a review. You have uh, what we call the G1 phase, the GAP1 phase. You have the synthesis phase where you are replicating your DNA, right? And duplicating it to have two copies instead, two entire sets. And then you have a second uh, GAP phase, a G2 phase before you actually divide the cell into two daughter cells through mitosis um, and cytokinesis. Now, some cells are not meant to replicate and divide, and they are in what we call either a senescent state or just, you know, they're just doing their job they need to do, and they're just kind of hanging out there. And those cells typically are not part of the cell cycle, right? They are what we call usually a G0 phase. And so those cells are not going to some of those cells can never re-enter cell cycle. Some of them, given the right cues and environment, can re-enter cell cycle. And when they do, they enter it at that G1 phase. So what decides where a cell is going to be in that cell cycle is obviously a very complex cell cycle control system. This control system um, is going to look at both the internal environment of the cell the internal health and condition of the cell. And it'll also take into account the environmental cues, the growth factors that are present, the and uh, you know inhibitory factors that are present and all that response, the response will be catered to all that those signals combined. Um, 
You know, the cell cycle control system works at every single phase of the cell cycle. It's not just under mitosis or not just under that G0 to G1 transition. It's going to happen at every single part. There's a separate control system, right? So just looking at a couple of them here, it is showing you what dictates when a cell will enter mitosis and then what... Uh, what type of control may happen during mitosis. But we'll talk about others as well in a little bit. So for example, before a cell can enter mitosis, it has to make sure that all the DNA was replicated and any mistakes that were made during replication or in general have been repaired. Um, in addition, actually, there are other type of things that are also getting looked at. For example, there is also a check of the environment as well as the health of the cell and insurance that there's enough material to divide the cell into two viable daughter cells before a cell is allowed to go into mitosis. Now, even during mitosis, in the middle of mitosis, there's a second checkpoint where it looks at making sure that the chromosomes are lining up properly and then making sure that they are getting pulled apart appropriately so that both daughter cells will get a complete set of genome, not a mismatch or not a mistake, you know, a, a disrupted genome. So those are examples of where and how you might control them. Another would be transition from G1 to S phase. So a cell that is in cell cycle, but is just doing its job, isn't getting any growth factors will stay in G1 or this gap one phase until there's a signal from outside signaling that more cells are needed. That kind of pro-growth signal along with other signals within the cell will trigger a transition from G1 into S phase. Again, that's controlled by multiple regulatory proteins that will check for those things before they allow the cell to go into S phase and duplicate or replicate its DNA. Um, now, you can see, um, you know, or you can study this by looking at uh, frog eggs, usually, um, or other type of, you know, simple eggs. We also look at um, not just frog eggs, but um, zebrafish eggs, also the same way, uh, to discover different types of proteins or factors that may be important in this process, in this control process. A lot of your actual even Nobel Prize research that you will see that helped, uh, you know, all the research that helped us understand many of our basic science related, you know, cell signaling pathways, all these cell cycle control systems, differentiation systems, a lot of it actually doesn't happen in uh, necessarily actual organism research. Like it's not human research that's getting Nobel Prizes. It's usually research done in a very basic model systems, like frogs, like zebrafish, like um, C. elegans, you know, those little worms, uh, and then also uh, in uh, yeast. So those are eukaryotic cells, uh, but they're simple model systems. They're much easier to replicate and much easier to get large number of replicates and large amount of data to back your assertions. So that's usually where we see a lot of really good science, you know, questions being answered is in those simple model systems and not in a complex organism like a mouse and a, you know, human or any of those. Um, and that can happen because the genomes are conserved. A lot of these important proteins, those sequences are conserved across various organisms so we can take the cell cycle of a yeast or a cell cycle in a xenopus egg and relate it back to other eukaryotic systems, including humans, uh, because it's the same proteins, the same general system working in all of them. And that's an important thing to you know, understand and know. So one of the things uh, initially when they were working on cell cycle control uh, was that they realized that um, there has to be something that's controlling obviously, but they didn't know if what it was. And 
So they tried to figure out, uh, first of all, if it was just a protein or if it was just a, you know, a bunch of different proteins that were having that effect. And to check for that, what they did was they took cytoplasm from an M phase cell, something that was, you know, in the middle of mitosis, getting started with mitosis, and they injected it into a oocyte, a xenopus egg, that was not currently in a cell division. It had its nucleus, it had everything. And what they noticed was that just the injection of the cytoplasm from an M phase cell triggered the cell into M phase, just drove it straight into M phase without anything else happening around it. So they could easily detect spindle formation inside it and they could see that there was something happening in there um, that was going to trigger uh, cell division. Similarly, if they took cytoplasm from a cell that was in any other phase but mitosis, right, which is what we call the interphase. Uh, so if the cell is not an M phase, then everything else is what is the interphase. Uh, so if they took cytoplasm from a cell and in interphase, they noticed that the oocyte did not enter M phase and just remained the way it was. And that told them that there was some factor in that cytoplasm, right? There was some um, something in that cytoplasmic goo that was there that was triggering the cells into mitosis. Now, what could be in the cytoplasm, right? It's not DNA usually, right? DNA is in the nucleus. And that would tell you that it is a protein or a bunch of different proteins that are present in the cytoplasmic stuff that are triggering mitosis in the cells. So then they went further and they started to recognize at that time, initially, they just called it mitosis promoting factor, right? But they didn't know what it was other than that it would be some protein or a mix of proteins. And then they started to study it more in detail to look at exactly what it is that is controlling um, the, this promotion into mitosis or promotion into cell cycle. And they found a series of proteins which they named cyclin-dependent protein kinases, or CDKs. The cyclin-dependent protein kinases are normally found in the cytoplasm, but they are in an inactive state until a cyclin binds to it. And they are called cyclin. This class of protein is called cyclin because they seem to cycle um, in a, you know, throughout this life cycle, uh, lifespan of the cell. Uh, in certain phases, you'll see a particular cyclin promoting a factor or a cyclin getting really enhanced in production and binding to its particular cyclin-dependent kinase and then promoting it to do its work. So the progression through cell cycle depends on these cyclins that are cyclically produced that bind to their associated cyclin-dependent protein kinases. Now, if it's binding to a kinase to activate it, what is going to be the downstream effect? Who's going to tell me? What's going to be the downstream effect of a cyclin dependent protein kinase getting activated? You guys there? So think about what do kinases do? I can't see the chat. Yes, kinases phosphorylate other proteins. So when you activate a cyclin dependent kinase, you expect to see phosphorylation of some proteins downstream of it, right? Some proteins that are part of that system. Let's see if the chat will show up now. Yes, it will phosphorylate. So you that's what that gives them a you know idea as to what they should be looking for. They should be looking for phosphorylations of other proteins to either enhance their activity or inhibit their activity. Um, so then we they you know through a lot of different kind of research uh, related to this they were able to map out different types of CDKs. The first one was related to the mitosis specifically, since that's what they were focusing on. 
And they looked at, they initially just called it MCDK activity. So M mitosis related cyclin dependent kinase and M cyclin concentration, because they didn't know uh, how later on they were all named differently, uh, which one was there at that time. And they only had one information point at that time. So they saw that the mito mitotic cyclin concentration went up during the mitosis phase, went down during interphase, and then started to go back up until it reached its peak in mitosis, and then sharply got degraded as the mitosis uh, happened. So that allowed them to you know, map out a particular cyclin CDK activity uh, over the course of the cell cycle. Now, um, through further research, they found that each part of cell cycle had its own CDK partner and its own cyclin. Some of these cyclins happen to be there throughout cell cycle. Cyclin D is one of those. Cyclin D essentially just tells the cell you're cycling. You're in some part of cell cycle. You're not a senescent cell. You're not in G0 you are a G1 through mitosis, somewhere in there. You are basically a cell undergoing cells, capable of going through cell cycle. And that CDK, uh, you know, uh, cyclin D has multiple CDK partners. It can bind to four or six. And depending on which one it's binding to, will take it into either just a G0, a G1S phase or the G2M area. Secondly, we have um, a cyclin E, which is something that helps the cell transition from G1 into S phase. So cyclin E production, you will see starting to go up at the end of G1, triggering the cell into S phase. And it binds to CDK2 and activates um, that through its interaction. Now, once a cell is in S phase and actively replicating DNA, um, it does so with the help of another cyclin called cyclin A. Cyclin A production is a clear sign that the cell is currently in S phase, or not just uh, production, but activation. So an activated cyclin A indicates that that cell is undergoing um, DNA replication at that time. Uh, and it again binds to the same CDK as the cyclin E uh, with CDK2. And finally, you have another cyclin called cyclin B that increases throughout your S phase um, and G2 phase. Uh, and it is actually at maximum level at the end of G2. And its rapid degradation is what triggers mitosis. So cyclin B activity is seen enhanced during G2 uh, phase and it's rapidly uh, degraded as the cell divides in mitosis uh, so that by the end of mitosis, it is completely gone. At the end of class today, I'll see if I can show you a cool video that will show you that activity in action. Um, and it partners with another uh, fourth cyclin called CDK1. Now, how do these actually work? Well, they work through multiple ways. Some of them work through activation, through phosphorylation, uh, but they are also regulated on the flip side by rapid or slow, depending on the cyclin degradation of these uh, cyclin as well. So the CDK is activated when an, a cyclin is bound to it. And then when the job of that cyclin is done, the CDK is done, um, ubiquitination of the cyclin specifically leads to degradation of that cyclin through the proteasomal pathway, leading to inactivation of the CDK. Now, CDKs are always going to be present and always going to be present at about the same level. You don't see as much variation in the amount of CDK that's present in the cell that kind of remains more constant, but the cyclin amount changes with the cell cycle. So that's what's controlling the activity of these CDKs that are always hanging out, ready for action in the cell, but in their inactive form. Questions about that before we look at the next slide. 
There was a question in the chat. And there was a question in the chat? Uh oh. Yes. Yeah. The chat keeps disappearing on me nowadays. I'm not sure why. So if cell was undergoing S phase, there will be a low concentration of free cyclinase since it will be bound to SCBK. Yes, there will be um, less concentration of uh, free cyclin A, but there's also another thing that once it's activated, and we'll talk about that, I think, further in the lecture today, cyclin A is normally found in the cytoplasm um, under when it's free, so to speak. When it's bound to the CDK, it actually translocates into the nucleus where replication is going to happen. Um, and so we, when we are doing, for example, when we are looking at cyclin A, we can observe it in the tissues by looking at its localization to see if it is bound already to the CDK and gone, translocated into the nucleus, which is what we call our active uh, cyclin A CDK complex. So it is that shows that the cell is actually replicating DNA at that time. Uh, sometimes you see it kind of diffusely present in the cytoplasm, so it's coming up, but it's not yet um, bound to enough CDKs to create that uh, S phase transition. Does that help? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. He said, okay, thanks in the chat. Yeah, I know, I see it. I went out and in from the. Uh, PowerPoint to see. Um, so this binding uh -huh. uh, will happen in the nucleus when the cyclin is in like the cytoplasm, then it no, will enter. No, it binds the in the cytoplasm and then translocates into the nucleus after binding. That's the activity promotion. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah so the active complex is what's going to go translocate to the nucleus, not just by itself. Okay. Okay, then the, 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 you know, like if we were to look at it with a Western blot, for example, where we're just looking at proteins that have already been separated on a gel, right? Remember, when we run a Western blot, it's not going to be uh, proteins in their complexes anymore, because all the proteins have been separated out and linearized, they don't have their tertiary quaternary structures anymore. Uh, what you end up seeing with cyclin A is um, kind of a double band instead of a nice clean concrete single band. And that just indicates the different forms, like, you know, the one that is phosphorylated versus the one that's just hanging out and not active yet. Okay. So talking about that, that comes here. Uh, so many of these cyclins uh, and CDKs require either activating phosphorylations or inactivating phosphorylations depending upon what it is that they are doing. Many times your mitotic CDK, for example, will bind to the m cyclin, right? And that is going to lead to its activity. That's the active form. However, you can still control that m CDK also by creating uh, another inhibitory response through an inhibitory kinase called V1. And what V1 does is that even though it's bound to the M cyclin, it is going to, if it phosphorylates the uh, MCDK, it won't be active. It will just be hanging out there, but it won't actually trigger mitosis until those phosphorylations are removed through another regulatory kinase called, uh, this is an activating phosphatase rather, CDC25, which will remove those phosphates and then it will activate it for mitosis. So because mitosis is such an important step, you will notice that it even has extra layers of regulation and protection to make sure the cell doesn't prematurely go into mitosis. So if there is certain environmental cues that tell the cell um, well, that trigger V1 production um, to inhibit that mitosis even at that G2 phase, right? Right when it was going to get started with mitosis, you can still have that. Now, certain drugs, for example, um, you know, will stall the cell in G2. Many of these natural products, anti-cancer products we've seen, uh, including saffron that I work on in my lab, 
uh, they will push the cell, you know, they will let the cell go through cell cycle all the way up to G2, but then they will stall it by, uh, you know, essentially not allowing it to go through mitosis. And what you'll see is either accumulation of cyclin B1 or accumulation of uh, this mitotic CDK M cyclin together um, without actually being activated to induce mitosis without cell division. So here is an example of how you can have that G2 uh, accumulation of cyclin B1. A big way that we can tell if a cell is stalled past the S phase, past replication, right? A cell could have easily stalled in G1, didn't have to go through replication of DNA, didn't have to go through G2. So if a cell stalls in S phase or before S phase, you see either just cyclin D getting produced and no cyclin B and very little cyclin A, or you see accumulation of cyclin A if it is stalled in the middle of the, uh, the um, S phase. However, if the cell was allowed to go through replication and it's now in G2 and that's where it's getting stalled by the drug or by the environmental cues or toxic exposure, whatever it may be, what you will see is accumulation of cyclin B. Now, cyclin B combined with CDC2 is that M phase. So this, you know, elusive mitosis promoting factor, this mitotic CDK M cyclin, this is it, it's cyclin B combined with CDC2. Uh, that's your uh, active MPF. It can, it's accumulated throughout the G2. You keep getting more and more and more of it until it reaches this threshold, this high, um, you know, its highest point. And at that time, if the other environmental cues, the other uh, master regulators like P53, like other DNA repair pathways are all go. And they all say, yes, the cell is still healthy. The cell has enough material. The environment is still good. Then that will trigger this process of dephosphorylation of CDC2, right? Um, that will trigger this complex to push the cell into mitosis by rapid degradation of cyclin B, release of the CDC2 to trigger mitosis. Now, if environmental cues, something stalls it and it cannot go through, what you will see is accumulation of cyclin B, a lot of it happening right there, or you can look at these post-translational modification, these phosphorylations, extra phosphorylations of CDC2. And you can say, well, this has a lot of these phosphorylations. There's accumulation of cyclin B1. The cell is stalled. It's not going to go through mitosis until this stalk, you know, this block is released. Um, so you can, for a, like I said, stall a cell even when all the cyclins and CDKs are present by controlling these post-translational modifications uh, through phosphor selective phosphorylations and dephosphorylations. Okay, you can also um, block the activity of a CDK by uh, upregulating a CDK inhibitor because of, again, the environmental cues there are also molecules present, drugs present that act as CDK inhibitors that you can introduce into, for example, an in vitro cell, uh, cell culture model or in an animal to look at this effect in real life. Um, so you have an active cyclin CDK complex. However, if you have a CDK inhibitor um, upregulated or activated, it will bind to that complex and inactivate its uh, activity and it won't be able to progress to the next stage of cell cycle, okay? So again, reminding you, cell cycle control system is going to use many different levels of control. The, at the most basic level, you have these CDKs that are always present at a constant level inside our cells, uh, and, but they are controlled. Their activity is controlled by cyclical production of certain cyclins related to each part of cell cycle. On a second level, you have activation, inactivation of these CDKs by phosphorylation of these CDKs so that even when they're bound to their cyclins, they cannot function 
unless those phosphorylations are removed. And then obviously you have that flip side of it that you have these um, phosphatases that can remove those phosphates to push the cell into the next phase. Um, and then finally you have inhibitors of CDKs that are additional proteins that can bind directly to those cells, to those CDKs, uh, CDK cyclin complexes and inhibit their activity by their binding. And until that block, some are reversible, some are irreversible. Until that block is removed, you can't make the cell go to the next phase. So there are many places in cell cycle that these work. And we already talked about how there is a G0 to G1 transition cycling. You have a G1 to S transition cycling. You have a G2 to M transition cycling. So there are multiple parts of cell cycle that are controlled by these cyclin and these um, activators inside them. In addition, you have additional blocks through phosphatase and uh, you know, kinase activity uh, inhibitors for mitosis specifically because mitosis is such a critical part of this cycle, right? And you have to make sure that the daughter cells that are produced are going to be healthy and viable. And that's why you have those phosphatase uh, with the CDC25 that can block entry into mitosis. You also have the uh, in, um, phosphorylations that are happening through inhibitory V1 complex. Uh, and then you have other proteins as well that can delay exit from mitosis if things are going wrong in the middle of mitosis. So they are even going to be checking it as it goes through mitosis. Okay. So this one kind of gives you some way, some reasons why these would be activated. So here it sees you that, you know, it tells you that if DNA replication was not complete, DNA damage was done, then you have the inhibition of the CBC25 to stop it, stall the cell until it can fix those problems. If chromosomes are not attached to the spindle appropriately, then you'll have inhibition of APC that will activate delays um, uh, you know, to exit mitosis until that is fixed, if possible. Um, if you have the environment is not favorable, it's going to stop the cell in G1 and not let it actually even replicate the DNA until the environmental cues say, yes, you can do that. Questions? So the autophagy, which one, which one of these stages in, inhibited in? So autophagy is a little bit different. A cell can be in any stage of the cell cycle other than mitosis. So any part of interface, autophagy can be induced, okay? As long as it's an interface cell, it doesn't matter where in cell cycle it is, autophagy can be induced in any one of them. That's simply a cell just stalling and starting to consume itself through other pathways uh, because it feels starvation. So it feels there's a nutritional deficit or the environmental is full of toxins and it is unable to consume things from outside. So here you see kind of those checkpoints that you may have. And this is just for transition to actual S phase, right? The first step after you go into cell cycle. A cell at this checkpoint based on what it the environment is may proceed to S phase only if the environmental cues say that more cells of its type are needed. Otherwise, it can pause here. It can completely withdraw and go back to G0 where it's no longer in cycle at all. Or it could withdraw and go into a differentiation protocol if there are differentiation signals available. And in that case, it would terminally differentiate into whatever cell type it was meant to be. So at each cell cycle stop, you will see similar uh, stalls where multiple scenarios can happen depending on what it is that you're looking at. Okay? Questions? Before we talk about mitogenic signals and how um, DNA damage can move uh, affect the cell cycle. Any questions? 
am I quiet today? Okay, moving on. <clears throat> so uh, one of the ways that our cells trigger cell cycle and actually start moving through from G0 into S phase is by receiving mitogenic signals. Now, those mitogenic signals are typically signal small, either secretory molecules that are binding to a mitogen receptor, a growth factor receptor, right? And you can think about those oncogenes that we've talked about in the last class. Um, those are examples of mitogenic signals, right? Uh, so you can have mitogenic signals that are activating mitogen receptor or a growth factor receptor on the membrane and they, in response, would then create this intracellular signaling cascade that would lead to the activated uh, cyclin CDK complexes in the nucleus that would then trigger the movement from one phase to the next. So you can think about you know, the G1 to S transition being controlled by that upregulation of the cyclin E and cyclin A in the nucleus, binding to the CDKs, creating that cascade. Um, so one thing that can activate, uh, that is part of this process are um, other inhibitory proteins that are controlling when a gene is getting expressed in the cell uh, related to growth. So most times those growth related genes uh, the transcriptional regulators are bound to their regulation sites on the genomes, but those regulators are in turn bound by L inhibitory protein. In this case, they are giving an example of common, a very uh, common uh, inhibitory protein called RB, retinoblastoma. It's another tumor suppressor. So in its activated form, it's bound to transcript uh, transcriptional regulators that are related to growth response or G1 to S transition genes. And normally the active retinoblastoma protein is not phosphorylated and it's bound to this transcriptional regulator and maintaining it in that uh, inactive state. When you have the G1 CDKs um, uh, activated, translocating to the nucleus, these kinases, the you know, CDKs here that are activated by cyclin E and cyclin A, will phosphorylate the retinoblastoma protein, causing it to lose its uh, binding to the transcriptional regulator, leading to the transcriptional regulator being activated, and then they will transcribe genes related to S space. So the CDK in here, is an inhibitory cyclin, um, inhibitory kinase, right? Because the active retinoblastoma protein was not phosphorylated. And when it is phosphorylated, it loses its activity. It's not bound to the transcriptional regulator it was controlling and allows the transcriptional regulator to work um, and transcribe the genes related to G1 to S transition. Now, let's say that you see damage in your DNA. There's a single strand break or double strand break or those timing dimers are for, forming, right? In that case, that damage, um, if you remember from last time, will trigger P53 activation. That's one of a master regulator gene that controls our cells response to damage. Um, so when P normally P53 again, the policeman is always there, but it's just kind of, you know, hanging out and sleeping and then goes home and that's it. So normally P53 is made, it's, there's no damage. It doesn't have a lot to do. It gets degraded as its life cycle goes away in the proteasome and that's it. However, when there's DNA damage, the activation of kinase is related to the damage like the APCs, they will directly phosphorylate P53 and stabilize it. That is your activated P53 when it's stabilized through phosphorylation. The usual downstream target of that is a gene called P21. And P21, it's a transcriptional target. So what it does is that P activated P53 is a transcriptional regulator, will bind to P53 response elements on the genome, 
and activate transcription of those genes. One of those genes is P21. The P21 is a cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor protein. It will bind to activated cyclin D CDK complexes for G1 and S and inhibit them so that the cell cannot go into S phase and cannot replicate DNA. Okay? So it is one of those inhibit CDK inhibitor proteins that will bind to kinases. Specifically in this case, it's binding to the G1 to S transition. So cyclin E, cyclin A, CDK complexes. Okay? So if you have a condition or a drug or uh, you're giving radiation to a patient in for cancer therapy, that specifically causes DNA damage, a very likely place it will stall would be in G1, okay? And so you can look for which cyclin. That's a question, by the way. Which cyclin activation would you look for or which cyclin accumulation would you look for if a cell was arrested in S phase or G1 to S transition. Uh, the video was cutting out for a second, but I think we all heard the question now. Okay. Yeah, I, I saw that it said unstable. That's why I repeated it. So if we are causing DNA damage that is causing the arrest of cell cycle in G1 phase. Is right? it the D? Cyclin D is present throughout cell cycle. So that's something that's going to be there regardless. Which one would accumulate and which one will be inhibited? So specifically think about the G1 to S transition and the G1 uh, to S transition related cyclins and CDK. It's the E. E. Most likely you see accumulation of E. And then if it was at that transition where the S phase was beginning, right? Then you would see accumulation of A. It was if it was in the S phase. But if it was in G1 phase, before it entered S phase, you would see accumulation of E because it would be at that border that it would have happened. Okay, so the SCD case, their job is to initiate, once they're activated, their main job is to activate DNA replication and to, re, uh, to block out re-replication. So you only wanna get one copy of the genome. You don't wanna continue doing it again and again. Now, there are certain cells that tend to be multiploid. Hepatocytes, our liver cells are one of them. In that case, also, there is a block to re-replication, but it happens a little bit later. So you can have cells that are, you know, that have 8 N DNA content or 16 even N DNA content um, before they stop compared to a typical cell, which will only go from 2 N to 4 N. So four copies total, right? Because of uh, two copies of your uh, genes. Uh, at the end of replication. So the SCD case specifically, their job is going to be to replicate, start the replication, and then stop it once all of it is finished. So it does that uh, through multiple protein complexes, again, working at that um, structure. So the, if you look at um, your genome and you look at the start of replication, if you remember, you had those origin of replication sites throughout your genome. Well, close to those, you have these origin, rec uh, to recognize those origin um, of replication sites, there are these protein complexes called origin recognition complex. These complexes are usually sitting on those origin sites. That's how we know where the helicase is going to bind and open up and start the uh, start that process. Now, these are normally also bound by other proteins, inhibitory proteins like CDC6, um, that is going to keep it in check 
so that it's not going to cause um, replication to happen prematurely. Now, when DNA helicase binds to, uh, initially, it binds to that CDC6 and uh, then to the DNA itself, which causes the CDC6 to dissociate, right? So helicase comes in, binds to the DNA, um, and this complex together causing the CDC6 to uh, dissociate and allowing it to be open. Now, when your SCDK complexes come in, the, the cyclin E CDK2 complex or cyclin A CDK2, one of the things that they will do is phosphorylate your origin complex, recognition complex, one of the proteins in that complex, so that now it's going to not allow another helicase to come in and bind to it. Right, um, and this binding essentially, this phosphorylation triggers helicase to get dissociated from the complex, start working essentially, uh, unwinding the DNA and start working with it, right? So this phosphorylation kind of acts like a trigger where it pushes the helicase away and starts the process of replication. Um, and then once replication is finished, it can't go back and bind to it anymore because it is already phosphorylated. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, so that's how it controls this process. Now, we also know that there are parts that sometimes um, damage to this machinery in a way that this, uh, you know, uh, either through DNA damage, there's so much DNA damage that it just cannot be fixed and the replication cannot be completed. Maybe there are too many breaks in the DNA because of X-ray or gamma radiation or whichever radiation we are exposed to or through drug toxic exposure that it just can't finish the replication. In that case, the cell cycle will arrest either in S phase directly or the cell will exit the S phase into G2 and the cell will um, stall in that G2 phase. So one of the things, this is a paper um, that shows what happens when you get incomplete replication and the cell is arrested in G2 phase. So one of the things that may happen, this is looking at a cell going through cell cycle. Uh, and this is just under normal condition versus under uh, a condition where the cell was unable to complete that um, replication. And what you will see is that the cells, both of these cells, uh, whether, you know, um, in both these conditions, actually, they've been given um, enough damage that they cannot finish mitosis. And so what you will see is that you will find cyclin B specifically increasing as the cell is going through various phases of cell cycle. And these cells will just kind of accumulate in this G2M transition place where they can't finish cell cycle because the replication was never finished. And uh, the cell is now going to be stalled in this phase. Now, one of the proteins that is responsible to check for this incomplete replication is this ATR protein. It's another checkpoint protein. If you inhibit that, then you see, you know, or if you uh, have changed its activity, you actually see this accumulation happening even earlier because it's not able to control it and get them all together into one place. So you see that cyclin B is getting accumulated and it's just going to hang out there and it won't be able to do replica uh, division, actual mitosis, because it's not getting degraded um, like it would in a typical condition. And if ATR is inhibited, you see this accumulation happening even earlier because ATR was the one that was recognizing it and forcing them all to get together in that G2 phase and just stay at stall at one place rather than stall at various parts of that late S phase slash G2 area. Questions about this regulation? Oh, 
Okay, not yet, but maybe after reviewing notes. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, so let's now talk about cell cycle itself. And first of all, just look at some morphological markers of it, right? To know what part will look like what. Um, so majority of our time, the cell is in what we call interface. It's not in mitosis. Once a cell starts mitosis, it's gonna finish it in a relatively short period of time. You know, um, I have videos where you can see them pretty much finishing mitosis within a few minutes up to 20 minutes. Um, so when it's the cell is in that phase, normally your cell is just doing its general work that it needs to do. It may be producing cell component, right? More mitochondria, more vacuoles, more endoplasmic reticulum, so that it is getting ready for division. Inside the nucleus, you will see the chromosomes are all going to be decondensed. They won't be in their nice little chromosome looking way. They will just be, a, you know, it looks like a tangled mess, but it is organized tangled mess. Um, it would all be in this chromatin form and you will have your nucleoli within them as well, doing their job, producing their uh, individual parts. Um, so in this part, the as the cell goes through S phase, it's still going to remain visually looking similar. One thing you may notice is the slight change in nuclear size as the cell duplicates the chromosomes um, and replicates the DNA. So there's twice as much of it. Um, you also in that time are going to duplicate the centrosomes that are going to be responsible for creating that spindle fiber with the microtubules. Um, so when we look at uh, that thing here, you're showing it a little bit exaggerated to show you all the various parts of the meta, uh, of the mitosis process. Um, even though majority of our cell cycle is right here in this interface, in mitosis you can have you have multiple phases within that uh, cell cycle. It starts with prophase, uh, where the cell uh, loses the nuclear membrane, starts to condense the chromosomes. And then as they come together on the spindle fiber and pro metaphase to create the metaphase plate where all the chromosomes are lined up along the um, equator, essentially the center of the cell. Uh, and then in anaphase, they will start to shift to their respective poles um, and they'll get there by the telophase uh, where the cell will then start to invaginate and divide through cytokinesis. Um, so those specific parts, each part of these are going to have their own little regulation within it as well. Uh, so one of the things that we wanna first look at is that what triggers a cell into mitosis finally. And that is your mitosis promoting factor um, and so the mitosis promoting factor, which at the end of the day is your cyclin B, uh, bound to the CDK is what drives entry into mitosis as it is rapidly degrading uh, that. Uh, it's normally uh, kept in this inactive state through the inhibitory phosphates. So you have accumulation of this cyclin B CDK complex until an inactivating phosphatase called CDC25 dephosphorylates that uh, CDK1 and triggers it into mitotic phase. Now, once it moves it in there, you will then see the actual mitosis starting to form. So one of the things that happens is that you, the one of the first things that happens is a uh, condensation of your chromosomes um, so that they can be divided up properly. This is done with the help of two specific uh, protein complexes, cohesins and condensins, that work together to kind of join those tangles of that chromosome together, the sister chromatids together in a ring-like structure that are then stacked on top of each other to create that final chromosome form. Um, and then those can then line up at the metaphase plate with interaction from their kinetochores to these uh, microtubules that are creating your spindles. They line up all along the equator so that when they separate, each cell is gonna get one of the sister chromatids as their 
uh, final chromosomes. Now, at the same time, when the cell is going through progression into mitosis and getting to the telophase stage, you will start to see bands of actin and myosin filaments forming in the center to kind of contract the, you know, invaginate and create that cytokinesis. Um, and they uh, form what we call a contractile ring. It's kind of like taking a rubber band and just tying it tighter and tighter until it separates those two cells uh, individually. And we will learn a lot more about how they form these in the next uh, set of lectures next week when we do cytoskeletal structures and learn about this uh, microtubules, actin and myosin more in detail. So looking into these cells, uh, let's look at each phase. So in your prophase, as I mentioned, one of the things that's going to start to happen is your centrosomes are going to start moving away, creating the mitotic spindle with the microtubules, while your nuclear envelope starts to get degraded. And inside, your chromosomes are going to start condensing with the sister chromatids joined together at the kinetochores. That's your first phase, the start of prophase. Then, um, as they do this, you will see that there will be two poles beginning to form uh, with the presence of these centrosomes that are going to those two sites. The centrosomes uh, create the central area where all the microtubules are beginning to form. And that uh, those little uh, fibers where they're generating is what we call an aster. Um, and the microtubules coming out of it that are um, you know, going into the, the actual centrosome complex are called astral microtubules. Then as they start to move to their opposing poles, this is all again in prophase, uh, you will have the production of spindle fibers uh, starting to happen. Inside, the nuclear envelope is going to start to move away and kind of dis uh, you know, disintegrate while the chromosomes are duplicated inside. In metaphase, you will see them lining up along the equator so that they can be separated out. Now, if you take a closer look at the, my, uh, the microtubules the, related to the spindle fibers, you actually see them interacting with each other in the center. Um, so adjacent microtubules have interaction with each other that stabilizes the structure and keeps it intact. Otherwise, these microtubules are always kind of, you know, uh, polymerizing and then depolymerizing. So you have constant movement of these microtubules to, you know, make them longer and shorter. However, because these interactions are present, it stabilizes these microtubule structures so that it can remain intact until it is needed to be separated. So in pro-metaphase is where the nuclear envelope is all disintegrated and these chromosomes that were formed in your pro, uh, prophase start to com uh, come in to that kinetochore uh, microtubules and bind to them through that central structure. So this is looking at that um, in a fluorescent microscopy image. You can see your microtubules you can see those astral uh, structures on both sides with the centrosomes. And then you see these chromosomes. They're pretty large chromosomes compared to these microtubules coming in to organize along that structure in chromatophase. Looking at that interaction closely again, more in detail, you will notice that the kinetochores uh, have these uh, interactions with the one of the ends of the microtubules. This is what we call the plus end of the microtubules. This is where more uh, molecules are getting attached to elongate that microtubule structure on this end. The, it is not binding directly to these uh, microtubules, but rather with the help of these other connecting protein complexes that kind of create a junction between them, right? An anchor between them so that there is still movement of the microtubule intact and it still has freedom of movement both inward and outward 
while uh, connecting it to the kinetic core of your replicated chromosome. So it's important to know that, that it's not directly connecting to the microtubule, but rather connecting with the help of this connecting protein complexes that are kind of like these little, um, you know, uh, rope structures binding to both the kinetic core and to the microtubule, and that is there. Now in metaphase, again, you're seeing a fluorescent image on this side, uh, light micrograph looking at chromosomes lined up at the central uh, point of the cell. Uh, the chromosomes have finally lined up to the correct stage. You have the astral microtubules that are just maintaining the structure of the um, spindle fibers. And you have the actual kinetic core microtubules that are the longer microtubules bound to each one of the chromosomes through the kinetic core interaction. And then that is um, where a checkpoint occurs with the APC to look at and ensure that the chromosomes are lined up properly and that they are um, each one of the citochromatoid is going to lead to the opposite side of the spindle fiber. Here you can see a culture um, that is looking, this is looking at a Drosophila uh, culture or Drosophila section of uh, their uh, tissue where a bunch of cells are in the middle of mitosis at the same time. So these are synchronized cells, right? This is synchronous mitosis in Drosophila. And you can see every single cell is at the same exact phase. You can also replicate this in culture artificially by treating them with drugs to get them to the same point in cell cycle and to remove that trigger at the same time. And you see all the cells undergoing the same phase at the same time. And then finally, uh, in anaphase, you see the cells are now in the middle of division where the chromosomes, the two sister chromatids have separated. They are moving outwards uh, to their respective poles. Um, and again, you can see that in ac action and actual cells where it's been stained, the chromosome is stained blue and the microtubules are stained red and you can see how they would be separating away from each other. Um, I'm sure you guys saw some of that in GB1 as well, where you were looking at that in onion root and looking at mitosis in there, you would have seen various forms of uh, cell cycle phases all throughout that. Now, something happens at this point where the sister chromatids cannot separate properly. You can actually visualize that by seeing a kind of a, you know, lone chromosome alone by the side or not separating properly. And the cell can actually detect it as well uh, in their, through the um, proteins, regulatory proteins, which can then stall the cell at that point and prevent it from finishing mitosis. And then uh, once those uh, microchromosomes have gone to their respective poles, in telophase, you start to see the contractile ring formation with the actin and myosin coming together to create those structures leading to the breakdown of the cell and causing cytokinesis. A second thing that happens during that point is reformation of nuclear envelope in both sides leading to the and the decondensation of the chromosomes so that they can go back into their normal stage. So how does this happen? Well, the nuclear uh, proteins, remember you had those nuclear pores that were maintaining the channels for transport of molecules in and out of the nucleus. Well, that those nuclear pore proteins are what get phosphorylated in the beginning of um, mitosis. That leads to disintegration of that structure. The entire system gets destroyed by that. Uh, similarly, you had the structure of lemon proteins underneath the nuclear envelope. Remember, you have the double membrane in there, and then you had that structure of anchor proteins inside that the chromatin was anchored to. Well, those are also getting phosphorylated and that causes this whole structure to be destabilized and separated out. Now, once you are going to telophase, you see a dephosphorylation of all these proteins, allowing the structure to come back together and reforming around the new 
chromosomes on each pulse leading to the final nuclear uh, fusion con uh, and production of those nuclear metabolites. And then in cytokinesis, you see, again, the actin and myosin filaments causing the cell to separate uh, by dividing them into two through the help of that contractile lens. Um, you can see that again in action in this electron microscope uh, image of a cell dividing. Uh, this is what we call a cleavage furrow as the cell is kind of, you know, getting wound tightly by that contractile ring to separate and break away. So how are we doing on time? Are there any questions? We are actually out of time. So we will stop here. Are there any questions? Oh, my, I guess the question is, um, the class goes until, what is it, 1205? 1205, is 1205 the exactly. time? Okay. Yes, yes. I always, like, never want to interrupt you, so. I know, I'm so sorry. And I need to have, I have a clock I ordered, so I can have it in front of me. Um, but yeah, so we will start by going through the cell division cycle next time and looking at that last portion before moving to um, cytoskeletal structures next week. Okay? Thank you, Professor. Interesting no lecture. Take care. Thank you. Have a great day, Professor. You too. Any questions? No? Sounds good. Professor? Yes. I had a quick question on the lab. Would I be able to ask that right now? Um, let me pause the recording and then you can ask me. How about that? Okay, sounds good. Okay, so we are going to finish up the next couple of slides to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Okay. So as we were talking about this, um, you have the cleavage furrow that forms in a animal cell and that contractile ring helps break apart the cell through cytokinesis. Um, now in an animal cell, that's just a simple process through that. However, in a plant cell, you also have to have development of that new cell wall in between those two cells. Um, and that's done with the uh, Golgi derived vesicles coming in with the material to combine those two, uh, combine it together into these, uh, the new completed cell wall. This area that is working um, similarly, right? So in this case, you have what we call fragmoplast microtubules that are around the central cell wall section, separating the cytoplasmic space. Goes, as the Golgi derived vesicle create the new cell wall. Um, this whole area is called a, a fragma, uh, fragmoplast. And then once that wall is built, you have your new daughter cells uh, form at the end of the day. So just reviewing mitosis um, before the next lecture, it is um, the process through which you get your two daughter cells. Um, it is started with the centrosomes duplicating uh, to help form the two poles of the spindle, and they are the ones that are going to assemble that mitotic spindle. It starts it in the prophase as they move to the opposite poles and create this uh, spindle fibers. The chromosomes um, condense in prophase and uh, bind to the mitotic spindle through interaction with the kinetochores in um, kinetochore microtubules with the kinetochores and chromatophase. Uh, and these chromosomes are gonna line up at the spindle equator uh, in the metaphase. And then finally, you have um, gordiolysis uh, happen that triggers the cystochromatid separation during anaphase. Um, and these chromosomes then segregate to the opposing folds. Finally, if you have unattached chromosomes, that will prevent cystochromatid separation, causing the cell to stall in that metaphase state. Uh, and finally, once the cell has separated, new nuclear envelope will reform and telophase, 
once the chromosomes have, chromatids have separated and gone to the opposing poles. The nuclear envelope will reform in telophase and um, cytokinesis will happen. So next week, we will start off by talking about control of cell number and cell size and a little bit on apoptosis before moving on to learning about cytoskeleton and cytoskeletal structure. Okay.